you up front, I'm Simon Hyatt. During each episode, in partnership with the Saskatoon Star Phoenix, we take a deep dive into a topic of interest in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and in this case, all of Canada. Tonight we look at the 60s scoop and the long-lasting impact it has had and continues to have on First Nations peoples and our society as a whole. We are very fortunate to welcome in a pair of guests tonight, who not only experienced the 60s scoop firsthand, but have also helped shine a light on this chapter in our history. Reporter Betty Ann Adam from the Star Phoenix, and Dr. Jackie Maurice, the author of The Lost Children, A Nation's Shame. But before we meet them, let's learn a little bit more about the 60s scoop with this video produced by the Star Phoenix and Betty Ann Adam. In the late 1950s, early all the way through until the 1980s, thousands of Indigenous children were taken from their families and communities and placed in white foster homes and white adoptive homes across Canada and even around the world. Birth families and communities were not told where the children were taken or given any opportunity to get the children back. And the children were usually raised without any access to their culture, no connection to their families, their language, their communities. Some of the children didn't find permanent homes and were moved from one temporary home to another throughout their childhood, leaving them feeling not unconnected, disconnected to any place or any body. The practice of removing children from their homes was an expansion of the century-old Indian residential school system that was winding down at the end of the 1950s. It produced generations of adults who'd grown up without being nurtured by their families. Social breakdown, alcohol abuse, and poverty devastated many Indigenous communities and led to the conditions that created the so-called 60s scoop. In 1959, less than 1% 1 of children in foster care were Indigenous. Within 10 years, they made up 40%. Many of the adults who were children of the 60s scoop have reconnected with their communities and families. And that was the case in my family. We uh, met for the first time ever um, a year and a half ago. Director Tasha Hubbard has made a national film board documentary about my family's first meeting and the first week that we spent together. It's called Birth of a Family. And we will be talking more about that documentary by Tasha Hubbard and uh, featuring Betty Ann Adam and her family coming up in just a few minutes. But first of all, uh, Betty Ann, Jackie, thank you so much for joining us on Upfront. Uh, we really appreciate it. Obviously, there's many different directions we can go, and this is a topic that I, I hope we can do some justice to in, in a half an hour or, or so. Uh, Betty Ann, if, if you don't mind, perhaps we'll, we'll start with you. We just saw you in the video, and you certainly touched very eloquently on what the 60s scoop was. If we could get a little bit of, of your story, your personal experience, how the 60s scoop impacted your life, what, what do you remember from, uh, from those early days? Right. Um, whenever I think of the effect of the 60s scoop on my life and my family's life, um, it takes me back to, it began with my mother, who was a student in an Indian residential school, and who... Um, who came out of there, like many other Indian residential school students, feeling um, conflicted about her identity and her origins, and she never went back to the reserve to live. And so when she had children, she was a vulnerable person in society. Uh, she was a single mother. She was an indigenous woman living in the north, living in a small town. And, um, and her children were taken from her. And, um, so it began with my sister, who was younger than me. She was seized when she was a baby. A year later, they took me. I was three. And then uh, a year or two later, my, my second sister was born, and she was taken from the hospital. And a few years later, my, uh, my mother was living in Alberta, and uh, my brother was taken from the hospital. And um, so all of us grew up in white homes and we didn't know about the existence of the others we had no idea where our mother was or where our families were as far as we knew we were completely um, alone in the world but for our foster families and um, so 
it wasn't, you know, eventually I met my sister, mm -hmm. I met my mother. After she died, um, it became a real important thing to me to find my missing sister and brother, and uh, I did. And so um, I feel as though we were very fortunate in that we all wanted to be together and we were able to be together. And so that was when we made a film about it. Right, the uh, birth birth of a family is is the name of the film, and we we'll get more into that as the show goes along. But I, I would have to guess you're right that it's a fairly unique situation that that not many children of the '60s scoop would g then go on to meet their birth family. That's the, you're you're probably somewhat of an exception to the rule. Well, I think uh, I, I I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't think we know enough yet about the experience of all of the people who were taken into the foster child sure. system. Um, and I know other people who were raised in foster children in foster homes who did meet some or all of their families. Um, but I, I'm, I doubt if we're the majority to right. have met all of our family members. Um, and. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things that we just don't know enough yet. Sure, yeah. that's understandable. Uh, welcome in uh, Dr. Jackie Maurice as well. Thank you for joining us. Jackie, uh, you've written this book, The Lost Children, A, a Nation Shame. Um, I would guess in some ways there are probably similarities between your story and Betty's, but also probably uh, some differences as well. Do you mind just, just sharing a little bit of your story uh, going, going back to those, those early days? Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you don't mind me, uh, saying to prov provide a context, if you will. Sure. Certainly, it was the 60s scoop nationally and internationally. And uh, we had Patrick Johnson back in 1983 who called it the 60s scoop, which lasted well into the 1980s, if you will. And specifically, my experience in Saskatchewan in the late 60s, we had the Adopt Indian Metis program. Mm -hmm. um, a very much uh, a policy and a program aimed at integration because we'd moved beyond uh, the policy of assimilation, if you will, here within our uh, government structures. But there still was the, the push to, as Betty Ann eloquently said, to bring First Nations and Métis children, I would add, um, into urban, middle class, two-parent, and in some cases, Catholic foster homes. And with the Catholicism, you can see the, um, the extension of the residential school era of having children brought into Christianity. And not that that is necessarily a bad experience, but you certainly do see the prolonged effects and the intergenerational effects of the residential school. Well, our generation is being placed to, into adoptive and foster home situations. Now, more specifically, my experience is, indeed, I went into foster care. I was born in northern Saskatchewan in Meadow Lake, but in my specific case, and I do believe in many other people's cases, uh, survivors of the scoop, is that many of us were not registered for adoption. So in that particular case, what you have is someone like myself who was made a permanent ward of the government. And as a result, that just meant temporary foster homes, permanent foster homes, but permanent was never really permanent. Sure. It was more temporary. And even by the uh, young age of nine, I had been through 12 foster, well, 12 moves and nine foster homes, if you will. And within each of those particular homes, you certainly have, instead of normal, healthy child development and healthy connections forming, um, in terms of bonding, security, love, uh, validation as a child, even as an infant, if you will, and then a, an adolescent, you had many of the, the losses and the disconnects beginning to form. And I want to make it clear here tonight and to bring voice to the, to the experience and issue that is going through one foster home, even if it's a healthy foster mm -hmm. home, is still a trauma, is still a loss, is a grieving process, and to some extent, um, a traumatic experience. So you compound that by many of us that went through multiple moves, myself, 14 moves in 14 years, going for a world record, if you will. <laughs> and then, you know, so there is traumas compounded there, as well as uh, multiple losses. And then more specifically, in a number of those foster homes, there were traumas that took place, not only the trauma of loss, and disconnect and low self-worth or low self-esteem, if you will, that was beginning to form in my young person. But you also had traumas such as 
physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, spiritual abuse, uh, cultural losses, and um, different uh, personal, interpersonal, and if you will, systemic oppressions that began to, to start, were, that was also a part of the experience. And as Betty Ann said, we were young Indigenous children, female, young Indigenous women, and so our experience was compounded on several levels. Absolutely. Uh, much of that, uh, specifically your experience, chronicled in your book, The Lost Children, uh, A Nation's Shame. This is an interesting work because it's, on one hand, a very scholarly, very researched, uh, a lot of information here, but it's also a deeply personal book for you. It t tells your story. It must have been an interesting experience to write and, and get those elements all, all into, into this one package. Well, I would like to say that for many of us, um, research is an inner search. Sure. You know, uh, like many of us who were a part of the 60s scoop, you can imagine my experience. High school was not important at one point in time. Basic survival became really important. But through beginning a healing journey, if you will, I began to do my upgrading and start my university. Now, it was interesting because at that time I went to the Saskatchewan Indian Federated College and many of my peers are asking me, so who are you? More importantly, who's your family? Where are you from? Uh, what about your history or your history, right? What about your medical history, uh, next of kin? Many of these critical questions and that I believe not all, but some um, members in our society take for granted, right? You know, and not having a history. So it really created um, a shift within myself. I wanted to answer to these basic questions that people were asking me also. So it started an inner search and certainly it took a lot of um, strength and um, tenacity and courage and perseverance because um, this, this search and going back to um, discover our roots, if you will, and to, to uh, pick up the pieces is not for the faint of heart because Betty Ann touched on this. And what's really important is, in my particular case, it's not like our media shows. It's not um, a Bradshaw homecoming, pardon my language, you know, that, you know, you meet in the airport and it's, you know, happily ever after. Mm -hmm. Many of us, in my particular case, I did search out my roots and met my biological mother and my stepfather and my half-brother and a few next of kin, which is all wonderful. I'm very grateful for that journey because it's allowed a shift in, in, in inner heal, healing for myself. But what I would say is really, I always thought that I was a victim of the 60s scoop, but I realized that there were foster parents and foster siblings, and then my biological and extended family members, they were also uh, impacted, gravely impacted by the 60s scoop and left with no resources to pick up the pieces so that we could not only mend, but build healthy, constructive relationships after being apart for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. And, you know, that just raises more questions in relation to where we go from here. Absolutely. I, I know you mentioned uh, when we were talking about your book, uh, you mentioned there's, there's a story behind the photo on here. Do you want to tell us a, a little bit about that, uh, about the, the little girl in this photo here? What's really important about the 60s scoop is here in Saskatchewan with the Adopt Indian Métis program, it actually, behind it, there was a mass publicity campaign and many Aboriginal and Métis children were, their um, photos were taken within a social services office context such as this, a very neutral spot. And these photos were used to adopt these poor Native children who, who needed care. And so that's where I got my photo from. And actually, it's the only photo I do have. Um, like many of us, we don't have pictures and a history to fall back onto. But they say a uh, picture is worth a thousand words and a story behind it. And I think that too, we have to take a look at the context, the, the pamphlets and the publicity campaign that went behind AIM. Absolutely. Uh, let's shift gears in, a little bit and, and turn back to you, Betty Ann, uh, and this documentary, Birth of a Family. Maybe let's start a little bit uh, the origins, where this idea came, with, came from, this collaboration uh, with Tasha Hubbard. Um, well, it, 
when I was seeking out my family with the intention of bringing them together and for all of us to come together for the first time, um, it never occurred to me that it would be a public event. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it, that just, it, it hadn't occurred to me ever. Um, but I went to, a, uh, to hear a public talk given by Marie Wilson, who was one of the commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just so moved and inspired by her words that I was um, compelled to go and meet her after the talk. And I introduced myself and told her a little bit about, um, about my history and the fact that I'd found my siblings and we were all going to get together. And her first words were, who's going to document it? <laughs> and... Um, I was taken aback, but she was serious about it, and she talked about the need for the story of the 60s scoop to um, become better known and its connection to the Indian residential school system. And so um, I, I approached people that I trusted and uh, people that I knew, and I knew that uh, Tasha Hubbard, um, I knew her personally, and I know that she's a great filmmaker. and. Um, and on top of that, she has lived experience as an Indigenous woman who was adopted into a non-Native home. And uh, so it was just a natural fit, and uh, she was willing to take, do the project. And the National Film Board um, also liked the idea. They thought it was worth um, investing in. And uh, so I saw Marie Wilson speak on April 1st, and on September 15th, my, or 16th, my family met at the airport in Calgary and the National Film Board was there to record it and, and follow us around for a week while we spent our first week together as a family. Uh, that in itself must have been an interesting experience because you're having this almost probably surreal experience of being reunited <laughs> with these people that you're related to that you've never met. And then there's also cameras following you around uh, <laughs> what, just from a logistical standpoint. What was that experience like for you? Well, it was. It was surreal in many ways. I mean, but um, but actually just being with my sisters and brother, the four of us all together was, it was so satisfying yeah. and uh, and just such a relief. You know, it was something that for many years I'd wondered if it, if it could actually ever happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could only have been better as if we had been able to do it before our mother died. Sure. But uh, it was a wonderful experience. And, uh, and having the film crew there, um, we got used to it very yeah. quickly. And the whole thing was so new that our experience of being a family at that point included having cameras trailing <laughs> around after sure. us. And we, we were able, to, I think, most of the time to ignore it. That's great. I, I know you, uh, before we went on air tonight, you, you said that you've, you've now seen the film something like probably 20 times or, <laughs> probably, or yeah. so, uh, which is great. I know you also had a, a private screening with your family early on. Uh, talk a, a little bit about, uh, well, let's, let's talk a more about the film and if people who have, who have just seen clips or, or are listening to us talk about it, is there a way for, for people to see it? Are there more screenings coming up? How, mm. how can people see Birth of a Family? Well, um, right now it's the beginning of film festival season. Right. <laughs> As I've learned, I didn't know anything about films <laughs> and film festivals before, but um, the birth of a family will has been accepted into the Edmonton International Film Festival and will air, I think, th two or three times there, and that's uh, at the end of September, beginning of October. For I believe it's a one week or a ten day festival, and also in the Calgary International Film Festival, which begins a week earlier and goes for two weeks. So the, I think there's three screenings in Calgary, two or three. And um, also it's been accepted into the Imaginative uh, Film Festival in Toronto. So, um, and there's uh, some others that I believe they've applied for and we don't know mm -hmm. yet. Um, but locally, here in Saskatoon, the film has had several screenings and uh, it's part of, um, I think, the National Film Board this year for Canada 150 has a film festival called Wide Awake and it includes their entire film catal uh, Indigenous catalogue. And so any community anywhere in Canada can request any of the films, including Birth of a Family is one of the flagship um, uh, films in that I believe this year and uh, so people can if they wish to 
arrange a screening. They can um, find a room to do it, contact the National Film Board, and as, if they, as long as they're not charging admission, they can have it for free. Okay. And uh, so right now, those public screenings, uh, and some, some organizations are, um, are just filming it for their employees, for instance. Sure. Um, uh, but others have been public um, in theaters and such. Um, so at this point, those public screenings are the way for people to view the film. Um, but um, on November 19th, it, um, a condensed version, a shortened version, will air on CBC. Oh, fantastic. On CBC's um, documentary program called Point of View. Sure. And so the 79-minute film has been uh, condensed to 43 minutes. Um, so that will make it um, accessible to a, lot, sure. a much wider audience. And eventually, I would expect um, it'll become, it'll go on to the National Film Board's website like most of their catalog sure. is done. And <laughs> uh, there are educational materials that will be developed um, to go along with that shortened version for use in the classrooms. That's great. Yeah, it, part of the reason for making the film was to educate people, mm -hmm. and uh, and Tasha always envisioned this as a tool for teachers to help explain the subject. For sure. Well, that sort of leads me naturally into the next question, and I'll, I'll throw it out to, to both of you. Is this something that our young people are learning about enough? Is this? I, I, I know neither of you work professionally as educators, but... Are we doing enough to to teach this in schools? Are are young people learning about this this chapter in our history that that we should be learning about? Well, I'm I'm just going to say, um, and I know Jackie will have her own thoughts on this, but I don't know that right now the the biggest focus is children in schools. I think it's adults sure. that we need to educate. And I, I think right now, I think the film is focused more on uh, high school and university students. But I think that adults, people who are policy makers today, people who are making decisions about child welfare, mm -hmm. administration, policies, regulations, those are the people who need to know more about um, how the system worked in the past and and what went wrong when things did go wrong and problems with assumptions that were made about the ability of Indigenous parents to be parents mm -hmm. and, uh, and also some recognition uh, needs to be brought to, um, to the discrimination that Indigenous mothers in particular were subject to. There, there were assumptions that if an Indigenous woman wasn't married and if she partied, she couldn't be a mother. Sure. And I have had conversations with many non-Indigenous people um, in which we talked about that and I've said, I've put to them the challenge, do you know any non-Native people whose parents drank? <laughs> but who's, who social services never looked at twice. And I've had more than one person respond to me that their own parents were that way. For sure. So um, these are the, th these kind of assumptions, this kind of discrimination, this is what we talk about when we say systemic problems. Yep. And this is something that... Um, you know, adult members of society especially need to be aware of and and need to find a way to change. And as far as children are concerned, it's important for children to know about it too, but where children are concerned, what's most important is that the adults who work with those children, whether they're foster parents or social workers or teachers or doctors, that they those children's uh, that those children be asked to invited to talk about their experience and that their experience be validated. And I think, so hopefully those sorts of things, uh, that's my wish for, sure. for the educating end of it. Absolutely. And I just wanted to add to your question yeah. there, whether it's a reflective process or forward planning in relation to child welfare and an Indigenous-based child welfare model, one thing that's really important is that we do invite youth to the table. That's often rhetoric at 
various levels of government and even some of our own indigenous government um, processes say, yes, we need youth, we need their voice at the table. Well, we really do need to be engaging with youth and to hear what they have to say and why that's important or more importantly, I guess an example of that uh, to look back on my summertime experience is that uh, one example was the Evan Hardy media course or class that mm -hmm. is offered there. Uh, this summer they did a, a wonderful film piece on reconciliation and they had a number of community members, Indigenous, Métis, Diné, community, well, and actually a filming, a viewing of Birth of a Family. And in addition, I was invited into their circle to be speaking on the 60s scoop and my lived experience. So I felt that was a wonderful uh, piece. Um, and there definitely, undoubtedly, there needs to be more work and bridging with our youth and the next generation, our future leaders, if you will. But I feel that was a, a wonderful start in the journey. Absolutely. Uh, we are getting a little short on time in the show. Uh, a couple things we want to make mention of. Uh, I know, Jackie, before we went on air, we were talking about the fact that one of the most important things to you is that people who either need more information or maybe more specifically people who experience the 60 Scoop and want someone to talk to, need someone to reach out to, you very generously have said that uh, you're, you're, welcome, uh, you're willing to, uh, to chat with those people over email and give out your email address. So I'll, I'll just have you do that now and we'll bring up the graphic. So uh, if someone wants to get in touch with you, they can do so. Yeah, certainly. Well, I can be reached at my Gmail account, jackie.m.maurice at gmail.com and also Facebook and messaging. Now, why that's really important, I thought this, this is critical to bring up because, well, Betty Ann and a few of us have found our voice, our journey, our story, and now carry a message forward. Many of our community members listening in, perhaps not only within the city of Saskatoon, but within our rural, northern, and isolated communities, may just be beginning their journey as it relates to healing from the 60s scoop. And that can often be a trigger, and we all need someone to turn to. And I feel very fortunate in my life. I've had many old-timers and mentors and elders and just instrumental people that were there when I thought I was so isolated and so alone. So alone, pardon me. So I just wanted to let those who are listening in tonight to know that your journey home in making full circle and starting or continuing your healing journey from the 60s scoop, I'm here. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for being willing to do that on behalf of the people who will uh, hopefully take you up on that very kind offer. Uh, we talked a little bit about where people might be able to see Birth of a Family. If someone is interested in uh, obtaining a copy of The Lost Children and Nation Shame, uh, what's, what's the easiest way for that to happen? At McNally Robinson. McNally Robinson, that's the way to go. I ha I. Do you, if, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to make a little plug here. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote um, a backgrounder mm -hmm. biographical piece, autobiographical piece, mm -hmm. about uh, my own journey, um, which ran in the Star Phoenix and the National mm -hmm. Post, but that has also been condensed and is in this month's Reader's Digest. Oh, excellent. Yeah, the September yes. edition of the Reader's Digest has uh, a version of the scooped story that I wrote, which is about the experience. That is great. Well, you both have done uh, remarkable work uh, in terms of shining a light on, on this story that obviously needs to be told. People in Canada, young, old, we all need to learn it. So thank you so much uh, for, for being a part of our, our show tonight. Uh, we, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you. That thank is going you. to do it for this episode. Our thanks once again to Betty Ann Adam and Jackie Maurice for coming on the show, as well as to everyone at the Saskatoon Star Phoenix for being a part of Upfront and making this show a possibility. And thank you for tuning in as well. We'd love to hear from you as well. There are several ways for you to contact us and share your feedbacks and ask your questions. Until next time, I'm Simon Hyatt. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Upfront.